So, dear all, a very good evening. And one second, uh, sir, one second. I'll just intimate you first. Wait one second. Okay. Your video is yes, sir. We are live now. You can start. So, uh, yeah. Good evening, all. And uh, uh, on behalf of ISPE, I uh, uh, welcome you uh, to this 13th edition of ISPE ACS program. And uh, we will be, uh, uh, this is a flagship program organized by uh, Indian Society of Pediatric uh, Adolescent Endocrinology. Uh, today, uh, the theme is uh, what are homeostasis? And uh, we will have two case presentations uh, moderated by uh, 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 Dr. Rakesh and Dr. Rahul Zagirda. And uh, we have two eminent speakers uh, uh, and uh, talk on uh, the renal handling of water and electrolytes as well as on diabetes insipidus. I would like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Shaila uh, Adam. Uh, she is a professor in the uh, Department of Pediatrics, JJMMC, uh, Daungiri. She's a pediatric adolescent endocrinologist and uh, president is paid 2021-22. She's convener for pediatric endocrinology fellowship and author in pedi endocrine pediatric textbooks. She has published original articles and case reports and research articles along with review articles in the national and international journals. Uh, I will uh, hand it over to Dr. Shaila for, uh, uh, for further. <coughs> Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome all my friends, seniors, to this today's very difficult discussion, which would be on water homeostasis. We have been trying to uh, arrange this for last uh, three months, but somehow we couldn't do it. But uh, this month we have been successful. And um, uh, all thanks to Professor Daniel Bichet from um, University of Montreal, who is with us today to share his uh, vast experience in uh, this subject. And also he is um, um, the person who has been, along with his colleagues, been the first one to um, find the genetic mutation for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Welcome to you, uh, Professor Daniel from India. We are from India. We are very, very happy to invite you for this uh, meeting. And uh, we will start off with the uh, case presentations. First will be Dr. Payal from uh, Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health, Bangalore. She will be presenting a case um, of water imbalance. I'm not going to tell anything more than that. And to discuss this, we have uh, Dr. Rakesh, I think we all know who is Rakesh and he is a professor in uh, pediatric endocrinology um, from uh, PGI Chandigarh and he is also the joint secretary of ISPE 2021, executive editor for uh, Journal of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes. His special interest is in childhood diabetes. He has got many awards, uh, Commonwealth Academic Fellowship Award, RCPCH Visiting Fellow Award and ISPAD's Alan Rash Clinical Fellowship. So he has got more than 80 publications and uh, he has written a uh, lot of uh, chapters, uh, pediatric endocrine uh, chapters in uh, books and more than 40 presentations. Uh, welcome to both of you, Dr. Rakesh and Pyle. Now it's all yours, Dr. Rakesh and Pyle. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Pyle, you can start sharing your screen and start presenting, yeah. So am I audible? Yeah, you can make it slideshow. Yes, sir. Yeah, carry on. Good evening to one and all present here. I'm Dr. Payal S. Kupsad, pursuing my fellowship at Pediatric Endocrinology in Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health. I'll be starting with my presentation now. Master V, four years, 11 months old male child, a resident of Hosu, Tamil Nadu, 
uh, informant being the mother, reliability good, was admitted in our hospital in November 2016. Came with the chief complaints of excessive thirst, increased urine output for the last one month. History of presenting illness, mother reported that the child has a fluid intake of seven to eight liters daily and passes urine 12 to 13 times approximately in, the, in 24 hours. She also said her child woke up at least four to five times every night to drink water and to make today twice or thrice during the night. She also gives the history of reduced appetite in her child in the last one month. No history of fever, burning micturation, convulsions, headache, head injury or vomiting. No history of visual disturbances, polyphagia, failure to thrive, skin rashes, ear discharge, bony lesions or pains or seboria or bony deformities. Now coming to what is polyuria? Increase in the total daily output of urine. That is urine output of more than two liters per meter square per day or more than 150 ml per kg per day in a newborn or 100 to 110 ml per kg per day up to two years or more than five ml per kg per hour in infants or more than four ml per kg per hour in older children or 40 to 50 ml per kg per day. Coming to causes of polyuria, they include excessive intake of water, excessive tubular solute, which includes osmotic diuresis, salt loss, and aldosterone resistance. The most common cause of osmotic diuresis being diabetes mellitus. Salt loss includes cerebral salt wasting and adrenal insufficiency. Defects in tubular reabsorption of water includes diabetes insipidus and tubulopathies. Polyuria mimics like UTI, where there is increase in frequency without increase in the urine volume. Coming back to our case, no history of neurosurgical interventions, no history suggestive of meningitis. Family history, no history of, simi no history of similar illnesses in the family, second born to non consagiously married couple. Birth history, no significant antenatal history, Natal and postnatal history normal with no history of NICU admissions. Developmental history, normal developmental milestones attained, good scholastic performance, immunized according to the national immunization schedule. Coming to the summary at the end of history taking, a four year, 11 months old male born to non consagious parents with normal birth and developmental history presented with complaints of polyuria and polydipsia for one month with no history of headache, head injury, convulsions, visual disturbances, or failure to thrive. So coming to the differential diagnosis from the history taking, we can include diabetes insipidus, diabetes mellitus, renal tubular acidosis, and psychogenic polydipsia. Coming to the examination, the child was active and playful no signs of dehydration, dehydration, vitals were stable with random blood sugar of 84 milligram per deciliter. Coming to anthropometry was normal. Uh, no pallor, seboria, rickets or bony defects, dysmorphism or midline defects, squint, nystagmus or lymphadenopathy. The SMR staging was prepubertal tanner stage 1. Systemic examination was normal. Coming to the summary at the end of uh, examination, a four year, 11 months old male born to non consagiously married couple with normal birth and development history presented with complaints of polyuria and polydipsia for one month with no significant past history with normal general and systemic examination. Differential diagnosis includes diabetes insipidus, renal tubular acidosis, and psychogenic polydipsia. Now coming to approach of polyuria. Initial step is to confirm the presence of polyuria by an accurate 24-hour urine output measurement. Step two will be to rule out solute diuresis to exclude the possibility of polyuria secondary to hypokalemia or hypercalcemia. Use of diuretics or mannitol should be ruled out. And step three would be early molding, simultaneous serum and urine osmolarity. In, ca in case of doubtful cases, to go ahead with water deprivation test. 
this is a schematic representation showing approach to polyuria. Coming, to, coming back to our case, the input output charting of the index case, the fluid intake was approximately seven liters and output was around six liters, which is equal to 13.02 ml per kg per hour. Come to the investigations of the uh, case, the ABG done, pH bicarb, urea creat was normal, which helps us in ruling out uh, RTAs. Calcium was normal, phosphorus in the normal range. Serum osmolarity was 295.8 milliosmolar, milliosmolar per kg and urine osmolarity of 75.9. The pituitary workup done was normal. So after excluding the cause of RTA, chronic renal failure and diabetes mellitus, urine osmolarity and plasma osmolarity investigations are to be sent. Any plasma osmolarity of more than 300 or urine osmolarity of less than 300 milliosmolar per kg confirms the diagnosis of diabetes insipidus. A plasma osmolarity of 290 to 300 milliosmolar or urine osmolarity of less than 5, 750 milliosmolar per kg, we have to go ahead with water deprivation test where a urine osmolarity of less than 750 milliosmolars per kg confirms diabetes insipidus, after which a vasopressin challenge test has to be done to confirm the cause of uh, diabetes insipidus to be central diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. What are the indication of water deprivation test? To establish the underlying cause of polydipsia and polyuria, to distinguish between patients with central diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and psychogenic polydipsia. These are the normal values of serum osmolarity, urine osmolarity. When a serum osmolarity of less than 270 and urine osmolarity of more than 600 is present, diabetes insipidus is unlikely. A serum osmolarity of more than 300 and a urine osmolarity of less than 300 confirms diabetes insipidus. And a serum osmolarity of 270 to 300 or, and urine osmolarity of 300 to 600 is an indication for water deprivation test. Like in our case, where the serum osmolarity was 295.8. Coming to the procedure for water deprivation test, the test can begin at 8 a.m. The child is to be weighed after emptying the bladder. Permissible weight loss of around 5% is calculated and detected from the current weight to obtain the target weight. All fluid intake is withheld after measuring the baseline plasma and urine osmolarity and serum electrolytes. An early measurement of the weight, urine osmolarity, serum osmolarity, and urine volume is to be done. The second early measurements of blood pressure and serum sodium is to be carried out. Coming back to our case, the water deprivation test done in our case was as follows, where at the fourth hour uh, of, of water deprivation, the weight was reduced to less than 5%, which is 17.1, and serum osmolarity uh, raised to 3.3 milliosmolar per kg, and urine osmolarity was 94.6 milliosmolar per kg, after which injection pitrazine at, the, at the, the dose of one unit per meter square was given to the patient, and there was a and there was an increase after one and a half hour or one and a half hour, urine osmolarity raised to 230 milliosmolar per kg. So uh, the end point of water deprivation test would be a serum sodium of more than 150 milli equivalents per liter or a weight loss of more than 5% or a urine osmolarity of more than 800 milliosmolar per kg or a plasma osmolarity of more than 300 milliosmolar per kg. Now, how do we interpret the water deprivation test? A serum osmolarity of more than 300 milliosmolar per kg confirms diabetes insipidus. And a urine osmolarity of less than 300 milliosmolar per kg confirms complete diabetes insipidus. And 300 to 750 milliosmolar per kg confirms partial diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus is confirmed. Then injection vasopressin, that is at one unit per meter square, is given subcutaneously. And a 50% rise in the urine osmolarity confirms central diabetes insipidus and a less than 50% rise or 20 to 50% rise in urine osmolarity confirms nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. This is a flowchart showing the 
uh, water deprivation test. Once diabetes insipidus is confirmed, to differentiate between the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and central diabetes insipidus, vasopressin challenge test has to be carried out, where injection vasopressin is given at one unit per meter square. Uh, more, uh, more than 50% rise or double the baseline rise confirms central DI and less than 20% rise or no rise com uh, confirms complete nephrogenic DI. And a rise of about 20% confirms partial diabetes insipidus. Now coming to what are the causes of diabetes insipidus? Central diabetes insipidus or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus? Central diabetes insipidus is due to the deficiency of vasopressin secretion. And nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is vasopressin resistant diabetes insipidus, where there's an impaired urinary concentrating ability despite normal or elevated vasopressin levels. This is a reference image as uh, the MRI image of the patient. Uh, was not available or could not be could not be procured. Uh, this image shows the absence bright spot in the pit, uh, absence bright spot and there is a pituitary stalk thickening which is showed here. This is the MRI of a norm, uh, normal uh, MRI where the posterior bright spot is visible. MRI done for our case in the year 2016 showed a focal nodular enhancing lesion in the pituitary infundibulum, query inflammatory, infectious, or neopla neoplasm. Adenohypophysis is normal with posterior pituitary bright signals are not visualized. So coming to our final diagnosis, posterior pituitary bright spot was not visualized in the MRI. Hence, as central diabetes insipidus is with etiology of query inflammatory and infective was considered. Coming to the causes of central diabetes insipidus, some of few of the causes are congenital anatomical defects, genetic defect in the vasopressin synthesis, trauma, septic shock, renal irradiation, neurosurgical interventions, neoplasms infiltrative autoimmune and infectious diseases, and idiopathic. In our case, the congenital anatomical defects can be ruled out as the child was not dysmorphic. Traumatic, septic, and cranial irradiation neurosurgical interventions can be ruled out as the patient gives no history of uh, any of these causes. Uh, we would consider... Uh, Inf uh, infiltrative autoimmune or infectious cause like Langerhans cell histocytosis, lymphocytic autoimmune hypophysitis, or granulomatous diseases. Coming to the treatment, uh, in our case, the child was started on oral desmopressin at the dose of 100 microgram once daily. Reduction in the symptoms was observed. Uh, different preparations of desmopressin and lysin uh, vasopressin are as shown in the chart. Where the duration of action for desmopressin lasts 6 to 24 hours and lysin vasopressin lasts for 2 to 8 hours. Follow up of our case uh, the serum electrolytes was monitored serially and were normal. Growth of the child was monitored and was normal. A repeat MRI done in 2019 during the follow-up showed uh, resolution of the pituitary infundibulum thickening. The growth of the child was normal with so uh, serum sodium and serum osmolarity in the normal range. Thank you, Dr. Payal. So, uh, I would say this case was uh, relatively straightforward in the sense that uh, uh, we could localize the central diabetes in speeders relatively easily. Easy, easily. Uh, serum osmolality to begin with was nearing 300 and urine osmolality was far less than 385 around. 
So we could have straight away rather gone for vasopressin challenge test as well, but still water deprivation was done. And after three to four hours, we could achieve those endpoints which we were looking for. And we could localize that there was a significant response to vasopressin and then MRI pituitary gave us some abnormalities. So relatively straightforward, but many of our patients may not be so. So there are a lot of uh, partial DI patients where response may be borderline or equivocal, and we are actually confused and MRI doesn't give any uh, findings or it's normal. So in those patients, genetic testing or further evaluation in some form has to be done. Sometimes just giving a, a therapeutic uh, trial of uh, desmopressin could help. Then there a lot of other clinical parameters basically will help us decide which direction to go, like age of presentation, younger the child, uh, infants, I mean, uh, nephrogenic DI being more common than familial causes, uh, and genetic forms again have to be thought of. So for the sake of discussion, uh, I'm not uh, able to see many questions in the chart. Chat, I could see one, one question. Yeah. Yeah. So oral desmopressin for uh, vasopressin challenge test. I would personally not uh, use oral desmopressin using uh, during uh, water deprivation test. Water deprivation test is a relatively invasive test. I mean, it should not be done particularly in infants and uh, done to be very great caution. And when we are giving this uh, water deprivation or restriction for so many hours, and then we don't want to take any chance. So if we give desmopressin orally, child vomits it out, or I mean, we are not sure about the absorption and other issues. So I, I think it would be better to give uh, IV or subcutaneous uh, rather than oral. So, but still, if someone wants to give orally, uh, maybe some protocols would have give, uh, recommended that. In that case, dose normally it is around 100 times the parenteral dose uh, for the oral dose. Uh, so what I wanted to specifically discuss more about this particular case, if I talk of, so uh, Dr. Payal, if you could just uh, share the next uh, few slides. So diagnosis in this case, yes, we could localize that it was central diabetes insipidus, but what was the pathological basis or uh, the focus or pathology uh, which has led to this central diabetes in spedis, it was not clear. Obviously, the MRI pituitary showed that there was stock thickening and there was absent posterior pituitary bright spot. In fact, this is one of the most common abnormality we see in central diabetes in spedis when we do pituitary imaging. But this is not a diagnosis in itself. Uh, this particular MRI findings could be suggestive of many things, including uh, it could be just idiopathic autoimmune sort of uh, antibodies against AVP cells, uh, which is most likely in most of the cases with this findings in MRI and central diabetes in spiders would be basically idiopathic without any obvious underlying cause. But there could be some secondary causes like uh, uh, LCH, which we all know, uh, then inflammatory granuloma, sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, more commonly in our setup. And uh, it could be some tumors even. So, so those are sinister ones and we have to be cautious. Uh, most commonly germinoma may present like this and uh, things may evolve over time in follow-up. So it's very critical to follow these patients and their neuroimaging findings along with the clinical progression. So in this particular child, over time now, this child actually was... Uh, this presentation was around four years back, uh, 2016, around six years back. And over time, this child has improved and did not have any other progression, clinical deterioration. So we can presume that it was uh, most likely idiopathic form uh, of uh, this combination of pituitary imaging findings presenting with central diabetes in spiders. So... That was one question here that what is basic underlying pathology? We, we have to think of three, four options. As I told, idiopathic, then LCH, germinomas, uh, and some inflammatory granulomas. So we have to work off of those. And there are autoimmune conditions as well. Autoimmune uh, lymphoadenohypophysitis is a 
one entity which can present like this. So evaluation of pituitary stalk thickening, like in this child, how do we follow these children? So there is pituitary stalk thickening. We don't know what the what is the pathological basis of that. And there is pituitary dysfunction, how these children should be followed. That's another point of discussion. So there are recommendations on this, uh, well uh, documented in textbooks as well. So uh, any pituitary stalk thickening more than seven millimeter uh, is the cutoff which has been given. Uh, should ideally biopsied because a size more than seven millimeter pituitary stalk thickening uh, could be one of the tumors, LCH, or some other inflammatory condition which may have specific treatment. So ideally that should be biopsied, but practically uh, it may be very difficult and tricky, particularly in a child who is not grossly symptomatic and responds to our desmopressin treatment. Child is growing well, no other symptoms. So it may be invasive thing to biopsy that. So many of our neurosurgeons are obviously not comfortable. So most of the time, what approach we follow is just wait and watch and follow for any symptoms. So imaging is obviously done usually six monthly over first one to two years, and then maybe less frequently over the next few years. And over time, if there are more symptoms or signs of any secondary cause underlying, so we obviously have to uh, intervene accordingly. So again, I will reiterate that in such a case where we have stock thickening, absent posterior bright spot, we have to rule out the underlying secondary causes or possibilities, which Dr. Pyle also highlighted uh, in the etiological spectrum of central DI. So another point which I would like to add is the role of copeptin. Now, there are a lot of recent uh, data and studies uh, published in standard journals, including NEJM and Lancet, uh, very recently in 2019-20, where they have suggested that copeptin is a very good diagnostic test to differentiate first between nephrogenic and other forms of DI, and then between central DI and uh, psychogenic polydipsia. So can you move on further, uh, Dr. Payal? Yes, so copeptin, uh, as we all know, is a pre-pro-vesopressin, basically, and it's a surrogate for uh, ADH or AVP in the blood. So ADH, we all know there are a lot of problems with the assays because of the peaks and troughs, which we can have, and it varies uh, the levels. Uh, so copeptin, like C-peptide for insulin, so copeptin for AVP is a good surrogate marker and can be easily assayed. So next slide, please. So with the various data available, these are the recent uh, 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 review which was published and it has shown uh, confirmed now that in a copeptin level, baseline copeptin without any stimulation or water restriction of any sort, a baseline copeptin level of more than 21.4 is, is confirmatory for nephrogenic DI. And if it is less than 21.4, we can do arginine stimulation test or arginine stimulated copeptin levels. And if it is less than 3.8 picomol per liter, we can confirm it to be complete or partial central DI. And if it is more than 3.8 and was obviously less than 21.4, so primary polydipsia uh, is the possibility in that case. So this may bring in a new paradigm now, in fact, that water deprivation test which we have been doing conventionally over the years, way back since 1970s. So, which has is not really a very good test. We all know we have experience with this and it's not an easy test to do, particularly in younger children. So maybe water deprivation test may be done away with in the next few years, as this copeptin levels or assays are easily available in India. As of now, I try to find out I'm not sure if it is readily available in India. In fact, it may not be. So that's what I had to add. Are there any more questions? Dr. Rakesh, there are a few more questions. Yeah. Please, if you can take them. So Dr. Rachna, could you elab uh, she asked that if we could elaborate on protocol for rehydrating a child after pitrescin subcutaneous to avoid sudden fall in sodium values. Yes, so she's right. So we have to... Uh, watch for uh, hyponatremia 
when we do water restriction. So we can do it uh, rapidly. There is no issue with that. I mean, as, as per the demand, we can do it. Uh, cause for central DI evaluated? Yes, another question. Uh, I think I have discussed it. Although this child had central DI, but ultimately cause most likely could be idiopathic as per the course of this child. So over the last four years after he was diagnosed with central DI, this child has not shown any other uh, symptoms or signs of any other underlying secondary cause. So how to interpret equivocal results of water deprivation test? Again, it's difficult and long uh, exercise, I would say. Uh, I think we have to overall combine the presentation of the child. And sometimes we can go ahead with treating one of the causes like nephrogenic or central DA and see over time how the child is faring. So this has to be sometimes uh, uh, done. Mm, any more uh, in the chats? Uh, Dr. Daniel, if you please wish to comment on any of the questions which yes. we have discussed till now, you are most welcome. Please. Yes, yes, indeed. So first of all, I would like uh, to say that I enjoyed very much the presentation of Dr. Payal and the, also the discussion of you, um, uh, Dr. Rakesh, concerning this very interesting and very well presented case where uh, the likely diagnosis is, you know, thickening of uh, the stalk with some degree of inflammation characterized as idiopathic. I liked very much the fact that you did some dehydration test very carefully. That means that you started the de dehydration at eight o'clock in the morning and uh, you increased um, the plasma sodium only, I like the only, to 400, 248. And so that, and then you had your diagnosis. And, uh, and for example, you mentioned copeptin in your discussion, and it's very important to increase the plasma sodium up to, let's say, 148 or below 150. We like it in between 145 and 150. And then you take your copeptin level. And uh, according to the publications that you mentioned in the New England Journal of Medicine and Lancet, so that this copeptin should be elevated in normal subjects. And so you could differentiate between complete central diabetes insipidus and partial uh, diabetes insipidus. So, so that this copeptin level is interesting as long as you do enough increase in plasma sodium, as you mentioned. So this is uh, very much important. And uh, I have just a small comment also. I'm used to uh, inject sub-Q DDAVP. Uh, for to terminate the dehydration test to see, as you did, if urinary osmolality is going to increase. I prefer that to pitrecin. Pitrecin is um, inducing some, uh, uh, some paylor, uh, that means uh, some whitish um, uh, skin of uh, the uh, children of the child that you are testing. And uh, my, uh, the parents, uh, who are witnessing sometime uh, this uh, dehydration test do not like, uh, you know, this paler as compared to DDAVP that you can give, for example, at one microgram sub-Q, uh, which is 250 microliter of the one cc containing four microgram. Uh, so that is very effective too, you know, and you are sure uh, that it is given. I do not like at all DDAVP orally to finish because you never know exactly how it is um, going to be to be absorbed. Uh, so that I liked very much, again, your case presentation, very well done. Uh, the possibility to discuss the etiology the discussion about magnetic resonance imaging, very well done. And uh, also uh, the discussion about uh, copeptin, but the need to do safe dehydration tests like you did. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Daniel. Uh, some more questions in the chat, if I can just quickly run through. Uh, so was the workup for LCH done in this index child? As far as I know, it was a skeletal survey was done basic and it was negative and there were no systemic features of LCH. And we know older children like this five-year-old child, 
may present only with single organ involvement of LCH, may not have multisystemic involvement. And yes, theoretically, LCH was high on the cord and has to be worked up for. So I think the basic workup was done and then child was followed for any other manifestations progressing. Uh, what should be dose of vasopressin challenge in water deprivation test? One unit per meter square or five unit per meter square? Dr. Kirtna is asking. So yes, again, uh, I think there are uh, different views on this uh, as reviewed by Dr. Payal as well. We could see that there are one textbook writes one unit per meter square and other uh, writes five unit per meter square. So I think it could be either, but uh, depends. Uh, so we may say anywhere from, so we can have their own, our own protocols. And when we are, I think, strongly suspecting it or when uh, the osmolality urine and serum are not uh, clear cut about the DI, maybe we could be giving higher dose. Uh, that may be one suggestion, but any dose from one to five unit per meter square could be fine. Uh, more importantly, the baseline sodium has to be on higher side. Okay, so if okay. there are no other questions, I hand over back to Dr. Shaila. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rakesh, I think we need to move on to the Professor Daniel's talk. So could you yeah, please introduce okay. him? Yeah, okay. So it gives me a really immense pleasure to invite uh, Professor I Daniel Bishay, uh, who is Professor of uh, Medicine at the University of Montreal. Quebec, Canada. Uh, he has vast experience, particularly on the subject, and has done a lot of work in the field of uh, diabetes insipidus, as earlier told by Dr. Shala as well. He was part of the team who actually first identified the gene AVPR2, responsible for X-linked nephrogenic DI, and the paper was published in Nature way back in 1992. And further, he has been uh, working in this field and identified some more mutations, novel mutations, and also working in perinatal testing. Uh, the uptodate.com, which we all read actually and follow, uh, he has authored the diagnosis of polyuria and diabetes in spiders on up update, the latest update in 2022 as well. So it's over to Professor Daniel and most welcome. And we are looking forward to your very interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me uh, share my screen so that uh, uh, we uh, will uh, do that. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for this uh, beautiful opportunity uh, you know, to speak in front of you and uh, to learn also more. And um, I'm already extremely satisfied uh, with the case presentation, as I, as I said. And um, my presentation will be mainly on rare cases of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, but also mentioning central diabetes insipidus and other cases. And, um, uh, and so that it will be obviously complementary to the beautiful presentations that you and discussion that you already heard. Uh, does everybody see uh, my first slide? Yes? yes? Yes, it's yeah, it's fine. Yeah, please. Perfect. Thank you. So I will speak about central diabetes insipidus, uh, uh, which is uh, schematically represented on the left part of uh, this uh, slide. And this is a sagittal cut of um, the uh, mouse or rat brain and with the optic chiasma OC that is represented here and the orientation of the posterior pituitary in uh, mice, which is obviously in rats, which is uh, slightly flat as compared to what we see in humans. And on the anterior part here, uh, we see a group of neurons, uh, which are the uh, uh, median preoptic nucleus, the organum vasculosum of the lamina terminalis, and the subfortical organ. And in fact, there are groups of neurons here that are able to monitor tonicity. That means, well, plasma sodium. That means, uh, you know, whether the individuals are dehydrated or not, and uh, that are sending uh, projections, as you see here, to neurons that are producing vasopressin. 
that is the supraoptic nucleus, SON, and the paraventricular nucleus. And obviously, you know, the discharge of uh, this uh, product, uh, vasopressin and copeptin, to the posterior pituitary. On the right part of this slide is a recent representation here that uh, we published with Nina Knurs and Elena Levchenko concerning the action of vasopressin on the collecting duct, on the principal cell of the collecting duct, and explaining two types of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, that is X-linked nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, uh, which is a loss of function of the vasopressin V2 receptor and uh, autosomal recessive or dominant nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which is loss of function of aquaporin. So I will describe that. So, uh, um, you know, I have a certain age, and so obviously I have a lot of conflict of interest. I'm a consultant, I give conference for Fering, Otsuka, Sanofi, etc. These are declared, as mentioned recently, uh, uh, I'm uh, continuing to write in up to date and also in uh, endocrinology uh, type of, uh, of textbook. And you could have a copy of these uh, chapters if you are sending me uh, some emails. My outline is here, so central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus with investigation of treatment. I'm just mentioning quickly that thirst is normal in most patients with central or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Hence, these children or these adults are protected since each time there is an increase in plasma sodium, they will compensate with thirst, and thirst will bring back, obviously, enough water to uh, compensate and to bring back plasma sodium to normal. So I will describe autosomal dominant central diabetes insipidus due to uh, mutations in the vasopressin gene itself, the gene manufacturing vasopressin nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and I will mention also Barter syndrome. Barter syndrome is important because we may see that in inbred families, uh, and uh, you know you may see that in your, in your practice, this is quite important. Just uh, let me start also with a personal type of case uh, that uh, I was consulted upon, uh, you know, uh, 12 years ago in 2010. A young patient thirsty since birth, a young Canadian patients. And so that uh, I'm receiving that email and uh, the mother is telling me about Ethan. And ever since that date, that date of birth, he had a near constant thirst. So it's different from the case that you heard previously where you had some manifestations in the child when he was four years of age. Here we have uh, some early, very early manifestations. And so that's suggesting, obviously, some kind of a genetic type of component. This ethan would not take to breastfeeding because the milk came out too slow. When he was of age to eat food, he was cream to drink instead. By age two, we were concerned because obviously he was not growing normally, constantly thirsty and urinating frequently. And... Well, this happens because these are rare diseases. And here, the family doctor was not concerned. And neither the family doctor nor the pediatricians, he was thinking that it was something related to behavior. And uh, so that I was wondering if you might have any insight here. And uh, this uh, family was living a few hundred kilometers from Montreal, and the mother saying, you know, why don't uh, we come to Montreal? And uh, nowadays, we can receive blood, uh, blood in uh, the uh, postal, uh, in the, uh, with the postal office. And, and so that, uh, in fact, uh, I'm, I'm always asking uh, you, the audience, uh, these types of questions. Do you think that the excessive thirst is behavioral? And do you think that water should be restricted? So I hope that you would say no, uh, you know, because it's, it's too early to be behavioral. Excessive thirst and urination present since birth are likely secondary to congenital nephrogenic uh, diabetes insipidus. And we are going to make a rapid diagnosis of this. And so I wrote this mother back 
And I said, why don't you obtain some blood and send it to me? And so that uh, we receive the blood and it was likely to be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Most cases of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus are due to mutations in the vasopressin V2 receptor gene. We sequence that. It's a small gene to sequence. It's not expensive. I'm used to receive blood from all over the world, and we do that uh, sequencing freely so that you are in charge to, uh, to prepare the blood and to send it to me, you know, by FedEx or something like that. But as far as sequencing is concerned, we still do it uh, freely. And uh, we identify the mutation, VATM, and the mother is a carrier. And, uh, you know, similar to the case that was presented before, we had a urine flow here of 60 cc per minute, a very low urinary osmolality. The osmolality of the child presented by Dr. Payal was 75 something, but then there was no increased post DDAVP. We am used to uh, inject uh, uh, two microgram or one microgram of DDAVP, and there was no change, 55 to uh, 57, confirming that it was nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. We provided free access to water, and uh, he's a much happier child uh, now, and he's doing great and um, uh, receiving every Christmas, uh, you know, a very nice card and the parents and the child are in good hands. So, uh, so I'm saying here that genomic information is very much important. And it's part of a standard care for hereditary diabetes insipidus. It cuts the diagnostic odyssey. These uh, genes are easy to sequence. And you can use, obviously, uh, this uh, type of uh, technology for this and other diseases. So we know the uh, definitions for diabetes insipidus, you know, hypoosmotic urine. Uh, we heard already about the differential diagnosis with osmotic diuresis, which happens with glucose in uh, polyuria of diabetes mellitus, but also with mannitol, urea, glycerol, contrast media, and loop uh, diuretics. And uh, polyuria, the definition here, three liters per day in adults two liters per square meter in children. It must be differentiated from frequency or nocturia. It is mainly a problem with older type of men, not with young children. Well, let's go to the subject of central diabetes insipidus. And let's see again the sequence for the gene coding for vasopressin that you can see here, the AVP sequence, where there is a signal peptide sequence at the beginning here, followed by vasopressin, nine amino acid, 27 base pairs, you know, nine multiplied by three, followed by the transporter, neurophysin two, as uh, mentioned here, and copeptin that uh, as um, discussed by Dr. Rakesh is very much important now to, uh, uh, to help the uh, diagnosis. This um, uh, schematic representation of the gene, the different amino acids and the mutations affecting the amino acids has been published by Gary Robertson. Gary Robertson uh, is um, a leader in, uh, in central diabetes insipidus and uh, you know, he has been interested in those uh, type of diseases. So mutations in the vasopressin gene responsible for autosomal dominant. Well, autosomal dominant is quite interesting. So there is one allele that is normal and one allele that is defective. And yet the manifestations of diabetes insipidus are as, are as early as um, one year of age. So the first year is some way protected most of the time. So why is that so? Why the other normal allele is not able to, uh, to provide enough vasopressin? Well, we know very well how uh, vasopressin is manufactured in these um, uh, cells 
that are um, uh, in the supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. And uh, as you know, uh, vasopressin is produced here in the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, then is packed into those types of vesicles and moving here along those long axons to be uh, diversed here into the posterior pituitary. So it is a very sophisticated type of mechanism. And now, as um, uh, I published here in that editorial in the Journal of Clinical Investigation, it seems that autosomal dominance, the normal allele, in fact, the normal allele in the cells producing vasopressin is destroyed quickly by some type of degradation mechanisms. And so that the abnormal allele will some way make sure that the normal allele is degraded. Hence, these early manifestations of vasopressin deficiency very early on, as early as one year of age, are now very much explained. Let me tell you about uh, the common etiologies of, uh, of central diabetes insipidus uh, that uh, we know. Uh, we discussed uh, here with uh, Dr. Rakesh uh, istiocytosis, which could occur in 16% of children, as you can see here. But in children, we are doing magnetic resonance imaging, obviously not only to see the uh, bright spot, but also to rule out uh, primary brain tumors that uh, we can see here. Uh, and we can see diabetes insipidus before surgery or after surgery, rare cases of metastatic cancers, trauma, and post-infectious disease. So we know all about these things. As uh, detailed by Dr. Payal, um, uh, uh, she uh, measured not only uh, the response to vasopressin, but she made sure that her child has a normal T4, a normal growth hormone, uh, other hypothalamic anterior pituitary hormones that, for example, Dr. Magni in the New England Journal of Medicine found to, to be uh, decreased in 61% of 79 central uh, DI patients. So you know that, you know, not only that you should test posterior pituitary, but also anterior pituitary hormones. Let me uh, say a word concerning the uh, posterior pituitary bright spot, which is here. So it could be decreased, that means the intensity, both in central, and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So it's very important to know whether it is normal, decreased or not, but it will not give you a diagnosis, a differential diagnosis of central versus nephrogenic because it seems that it measures the quantity of vasopressin copeptin staying in the posterior pituitary and whether it is exhausted like in central diabetes insipidus, or exhausted also by constant producing in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So you have to use it, but it is not useful for a differential uh, diagnosis. Since you are uh, pediatricians and pediatric endocrinologists, you must know about this very rare entity, which is idiopathic hypernatremia with no structural brain abnormality by magnetic resonance imaging. It's very rare, but it occurs in patients, young patients that you found to be hypernatremic, that you found to have a normal concentrating ability, a defective thirst. Most of them are obese and some of them have uh, some kind of prolactin increase. And these investigator here, Dr. Noda in Japan, has been demonstrating that, in fact, they are due to antibodies to the subfornical organ. You remember that organ that is very important to perceive thirst and to relay information to produce vasopressin uh, by supraoptic and paraventricular nuclei. And so that if you have antibodies here to the subfornical organ, you will have autoimmune cell death and you have defective in vasopressin regulation, thirst, and also salt appetite sensation and other defects 
in other uh, 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 endocrine cells in the hypothalamus. And the result will be adipsic hypernatremia. And you can send some, uh, some serum of these rare patients to Dr. Noda. And he will infuse them uh, to uh, mice, to normal mice. And he will demonstrate that in these different cases, there are antibodies that you can see here by immunofluorescence when he's examining the subfornical organs of these rats. So it's extremely rare, but you should know about this. And there are some very nice publications. And again, for example, vasopressin is low in these patients, but they are still responding to vasopressin. But uh, you know, the, uh, uh, they are some way paying uh, here uh, that because uh, you have to increase the osmolarity to 310, 320 in order to concentrate um, uh, urine. The normal uh, vasopressin secretion is represented by this uh, green shaded area here. So rare, but you have to know that. So we know about central diabetes insipidus. Let me tell you about nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And it's easy to remember this schematic representation of principal cells, where you will have here the vasopressin V2 receptor uh, interacting with vasopressin and then stimulating through uh, adenylyl cyclase, cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP will phosphorylate some key residues of aquaporins here, represented as tetramers by these uh, 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 cylindrical uh, green things here. And uh, due to the phosphorylation of key residues, there will be expression of aquaporin 2 in the luminal membrane here. And this luminal membrane is usually complete, completely impermeable to water. And when uh, this uh, aquaporin is expressed here through this signaling mechanism, then there would be transcellular reabsorption of water and water will escape through other aquaporins, aquaporin three and aquaporin four. So two types of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, loss of function of the vasopressin V2 receptor or loss of function of aquaporins here. Um, so that, uh, uh, as mentioned before, my lab identified the first mutations responsible for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and we continue to collect many patients. And here, a flat representation of the vasopressin V2 receptor with 371 amino acids. And all those uh, red dots are representing amino acids or sequences that, that are mutated. And so diversity of these uh, mutations, and here a particular um, amino acid residue here, which is important for you endocrinologists, because you could have loss of function, that is nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, or you could have gain of function, that is uh, inappropriate syndrome of antidiuresis, extremely rare, by mutating this single amino acid differently. Let me show it to you a little bit because this vasopressin V2 receptor has been um, very recently in 2021 submitted to cryo-electron microscopy. And we know exactly the function and the structure of these different amino acids. And we can uh, differentiate here nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, congenital nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, with this mutation here, arginine replaced by histidine, compared to gain of function here, that is hyponatremia, uh, because here there is a breakage of this ionic lock, and uh, we understand better now why we see those different functions. So I told you about AVPR2, but let me tell you a few words concerning AQP2, because we see, and it is also a small gene to sequence, coding for this aquaporin 2, not 371 amino acids, but 271 amino acids with a lot of mutations here that um, have been identified. And uh, here, uh, the work of uh, my lab, and in fact, three different families from the Indian subcontinent, one living in Toronto here, 
one uh, and two living here in uh, uh, in London, London, UK, and all bearing the same acoporin mutation, V71M AQP2, and all also uh, when we look at the haplotype, that means the signature of these acoporin gene, there seem to be some kind of founder effect. So that be aware that if you see some nephrogenic diabetes insipidus in some consanguineous family, in some inbred family, in, uh, in these patients of this particular ancestral origin, you know, it's useful to look at this particular mutation and I could certainly help you uh, for this. So tell me, I will uh, tell you now about the treatment and about the danger of dehydration, which is very important for you. This is um, a, a, paper, a, a child that we published with Bockenauer, who is working in London, uh, uh, like me, on nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And uh, here, a 20 months old boy for, with uh, polyuria and polydipsia. Diagnostic of diabetes insipidus was suspected. Plasma sodium was 159. I do not like that, you know. I think we have enough uh, dehydration with the plasma sodium less than 150 or around 150. The urinary osmolality, despite this high tonicity, was only 100 milliosa. So the diagnosis is made. You do not need any dehydration. You just need to do some injection of DDAVP and to be sure that there will be no increase in urinary osmolality, but you do not need any dehydration test. A DDAVP test, you are some 63, 65, diagnosis of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. But uh, the physician was willing to do uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and, um, and uh, he was dehydrated further. And in fact, the plasma sodium increased to 174. And um, this, is, this should not be done. And uh, we found a mutation in the AVPR2 gene. So do not dehydrate further these children who, or do not infuse saline to these children. Because in, if you infuse, for example, one liter of saline, of normal saline, they will increase one liter of water, but they will retain 144 millimoles of sodium. And um, this is very dangerous. The plasma sodium here will increase by 20 with the equivalents. And so you can bleed in your brain and uh, you should never uh, do that. Uh, just a few slides concerning other complicated case of nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, characterized not only by loss of water, but by loss of salt, and sometimes also by loss of calcium. I'm speaking about Barter syndrome here. And I represented, I'm sorry, I represented here uh, the uh, cell of the ascending loop of Henley and these very important sodium transporter here, the triporter here on the luminal part and the NKCC do, and, and here the recycling of potassium. And as you know, mutations of these genes are responsible for Barter syndrome also characterized by polyuria, but there is a very important sign, which is polyhydramnios. That is, during the pregnancy of these children, there's increase in the volume of the hydramnion and um, sometimes often leading to prematurity. And for example, here in Montreal, we had two sisters with polyhydramnios prematurity hypokalemia. And uh, we have been uh, able to identify a HOMK mutation. This is also a small gene to sequence, and we can do that for you. Maybe you have seen that paper in 2016. There is a transient, transient polyhydramnios here and transient nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, which is X-linked also. It's very rare, but we should think about it because this MARGD2 stimulate membrane expression of this sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. So when you are making the differential diagnosis, it's really worth it to think about it. You know already about the treatment of central diabetes insipidus. It's very easy, you know, petrescin, DDAVP, DDAVP uh, intranasally. I prefer that we can use that early, very early on in life 
it's working very nicely. But for nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, it's more complicated. You could use hydrochlorothiazide and you could use also a low salt diet uh, because in fact, it will decrease the amount of water presented to the distal tubule. And the reduction in urinary volume is uh, incident to the administration of hydrochlorothiazide bears a direct relationship to a dietary intake of sodium. It's easy to do. You can decrease uh, the urine output by up to 30%, sometime with uh, indomethacin, and this is very useful. Just let me tell you one slide about lithium. Lithium is entering that principal cell of the collecting duct through the epithelium sodium channel and the affinity for lithium for the epithelium sodium channel is better than sodium. And then it will induce nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And I'm showing that to you because again, in the New England Journal of Medicine, this polyuric lithium patients that could be adolescents uh, could have been treated with acetazolamide and then with very good success, as you can see here, and have personal experience with that in um, uh, congenital nephrogenic diabetes insipidus or in lithium induced ne nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and it works. One slide concerning the high urine flow in nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. This could lead to dilation of the urinary tract dilation of the bladder here, dilation of uh, the calyces and the ureter as demonstrated here in one of my patients. And um, these patients with high urine flow, they must empty their urine blood, their urinary bladder often. They should practice double voiding. That means they should empty their bladder and then they should wait a few minutes and try to see if there is still 150 cc's left because if you leave that 150 cc, it will uh, lead to progressive deterioration of uh, the urinary tract with dilation and with obstructive nephropathy and sometimes renal failure. So salt restriction, hydrochlorothiazide, amyloride, acetazolamide, so that indomethacin could be very useful also in these uh, young patients or also uh, in um, uh, chronic uh, lithium or before an operation, importance of early detection by genetic testing of hereditary uh, cases. And certainly I could help with that. Uh, as I mentioned to the organizers, all these uh, slides are um, available to you and uh, everything is published and you can use it for teaching uh, without any restriction. I thank you very much uh, for uh, your uh, um, uh, for uh, your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Daniel. Uh, that was a great display of your personal experience and expertise in the field. Uh, let me see if there are some questions in the chat box. So there is one question. Uh, what should be the IV fluid of choice? Yes. In, in emergency. Yes. Uh, when we find a child with hypernatremic encephalopathy or severe hypernatremia. So what should be the fluid of choice to yes. begin with? Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's very important uh, uh, so that except if the blood pressure is low and except if we are in shock, if this child is in shock, we should never use uh, saline or half normal saline, please use D5W. And uh, it's like, you know, treating uh, hyponatremia. That means aim to change the plasma sodium by six milli equivalent. You remember Rick Stearns, you know, Richard Stearns, uh, who is doing the recommendation concerning the reverse, that is the treatment of hyponatremia insist that plasma sodium should not increase by more than six milliequivalents uh, per liter. And we should do the same for hypernatremia. And so that, uh, because some cases of osmotic demyelination have been observed, for example, like in the slides that are presented with this child that uh, waited and was very much dehydrated after magnetic resonance imaging which could have waited, you know, this magnetic resonance imaging. So uh, D5W 
and uh, calculate with the, obviously the weight of the child, the uh, distribution of water in this child according to their age, a, uh, just calculate to have a correction of plasma sodium by six milliequivalent. And then you have time. Do not, uh, do not go back to a normal plasma sodium. For example, change your plasma sodium, decrease your plasma sodium by six milliequivalent the first day. And then the second day, well, you have time, maybe three milliequivalents. Observe, you have time. Please, you know, uh, and uh, these uh, children, they recuperate. That means, but if you are doing too quickly, uh, so you may have osmotic demyelination. If you keep the severe dehydration, you will have also small hemorrhage that you can demonstrate with magnetic resonance imaging. Again, uh, like, uh, you know, you, you do like we do. We are extremely cautious and uh, we should wait and uh, we should observe uh, these uh, children many times during the day, uh, re-measure plasma sodium many times during the day. This is the way to do it. So there are a lot more questions. Maybe we'll have to quickly uh, sure. address those. Uh, one question, I think asked by two participants, role of hypertonic challenge test in diagnosis of DI. So maybe after water deprivation test, if we yes. don't achieve the endpoints, maybe there is a role for giving hypertonic challenge, is it? Uh, I'm yes, true, not really true, sure. true, true. So, so that yes, yeah. so so usually, uh, so it's extremely rare that uh, I dehydrate uh, patients uh, suspected of nephrogenic diabetes and sepsis, except if there are mild cases, you know. And if there are mild cases, that means that already your urine os osmolality uh, will be higher than let's say three hundred, you know. And then uh, if you have to have a diagnostic test, for example, copeptin. I mentioned that we should do the copeptin with a uh, plasma sodium that is in between 145 and 150. To do that, you may use hypertonic saline, 3% infusion. Uh, I do that only in my clinical research unit and only with online measurements of plasma sodium. That means before injecting the 3% saline, uh, you should measure your plasma sodium, obviously. And uh, we infuse it at 0.1 cc per minute per kilogram. 0.1 cc, 3% saline per minute per kilogram during a maximum of two hours. And then, for example, when I'm testing uh, adult patients with central diabetes insipidus, they uh, arrive uh, in um, the uh, clinic with a plasma sodium, let's say, of um, 140. And it would be 150 after two hours. And this is the 3% saline regimen that Chris Crane, uh, Mirjam Chris Crane, the, the senior author of the Copeptin paper in the New England Journal of Medicine is using. So you can do that in, um, in partial nephrogenic diabetes and sepsis. Most of the time, you do not have to do that. If you let the child uh, urinate with nephrogenic diabetes and sepsis, he will increase in the next four hours from eight o'clock in the morning to uh, you know, midday, he will increase his plasma sodium to a level that uh, will be uh, significant and will uh, help you uh, to test um, you know, either copeptin and the response also uh, to DDAVP. So you see, uh, uh, nephrogenic, it's easy. And uh, you know, retain, uh, retain your horses, <laughs> that, that means that do not dehydrate them, okay, great. Yes. Okay, so okay. another question is about uh, infants with central DI. Yes. So how to avoid hyponatremia when we start treatment in them? So they are prone yes. to have hyponatremia. So what would so be that's the precautions? Yes, that's interesting. So that, that's quite interesting. For, for example, you know, I saw that you are in, uh, injecting pitrecin. Okay. And some patients have been so used to uh, drink a lot uh, that, uh, you know, there might be uh, some kind of delay in between uh, the, uh, the cessation of thirst uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, and, and the, the treatment. That means that they will continue to drink excessively. 
so that um, uh, when I'm doing uh, these uh, testing, dehydration testing followed by uh, DDAVP injection, I'm used to tell them not to drink so much uh, the first night and the first day after the initiation of DDAVP. Otherwise, they could develop some symptomatic hyponatremia, and especially maybe maybe girls or women are more prone to that because it is known from physiological studies that um, they drink a little bit more than males do. So that I'm used to remeasure the plasma sodium the next day and to tell them, do not drink too much, even if you feel uh, you know, thirsty, because I'm afraid that your plasma sodium will diminish and that you will have headaches due to some uh, edema, cerebral edema. So that, and I'm used to uh, remeasure the plasma sodium. Some patients have a thirst threshold that is slightly lower than uh, others. And for example, some uh, central DI patients treated with DDAVP like to have a plasma sodium at around, well, 132, 133. And they are not thirsty there. So you could test, you know. The ideal is uh, to use the minimum dose of DDAVP. I'm used to start with 10 microgram intranasally, you know, every day. But some patients say, well, I need two times, you know, 10 microgram. So you use the minimal dose and you slightly increase and you measure the plasma sodium once a week during two or three weeks. You know, and then uh, you, uh, you are making sure uh, that it works. Sometimes, even with copeptin measurements, uh, uh, the partial central diabetes insipidus are not so clear as um, published by uh, the New England Journal of Medicine paper of uh, Chris Crane. And you may remember that Robertson was saying, well, when you do not know if it is partial diabetes insipidus or some degree of psychogenic polydipsia, you give them some DDAVP and you measure plasma sodium regularly. Uh, you know, I've done that. And I have a patient that is taking DDAVP once every second day. And uh, she has partial central diabetes insipidus. And uh, the measurements of copeptins were in favor of some degree of psychogenic polydipsia. But in fact, the treatment was partial central diabetes insipidus. So copeptin is great, but there would be, you know, some degree of variation concerning this. Yes. So another interesting question is about skipping DDAVP once a while to look for yes. recovery, to look for recovery if a patient is recovering out of it. Well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, I'm skipping uh, the, I'm giving some drug holidays to these patients to try to determine the minimum dose that they need. And, uh, uh, and or, uh, you know, to look for uh, recovery, which is, uh, which is quite interesting too. So maybe the day of the week that they are not working, maybe uh, they could skip uh, a dose if they are taking, for example, two times a day, they skip the dose in the morning and you ask them to uh, note, to uh, register the time of the day that they went back into polyuria and thirst. So that, yes, I like the drug holidays for uh, these patients. And uh, also uh, 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 when these patients are aging, well, you are mainly an adolescent and pediatric society, but every case of central diabetes insipidus, when they are reaching their 60s or 70s, they will improve and they will, they will need less DDAVP and this is both for central and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, they will have less polyuria. This is not due to the decrease in glomerular filtration rate. This is due to other things that we do not know. But you know, there are very few things in life that are improving with age. So <laughs> maybe this is one of those. Okay, okay, thank you. So thank you, Professor Daniel. Uh, I'm, there are a lot, of, lot more questions, but sake, for the sake of time, if you could yes. just look at the chat and maybe reply to those who are the questions which are left. Yes, so, exactly. If you could send yeah, them to me, yeah. Yeah, I will, I will so answer that. Right uh, now, maybe you can look at, at, the, at the chat and uh, yes, if you could perfect. reply, that yes. would be great. So perfect. handing over back to Professor Shela for the next part of the session.
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh and uh, Professor Daniel. Uh, it was an excellent uh, discussion. Now we move on to the next case presentation by Dr. Anshika Singh. Uh, she is clinical fellow in uh, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. <clears throat> and the moderator uh, for this uh, case would be Dr. Rahul Jagirdar from uh, Pune, um, Bharatiya Vidya Pita, Pune. He is the Next slide, please, Ankit. Pediatric endocrinologist uh, from Bharatiya Vidya Pit. Okay. Now, Dr. Rahul and Dr. Anshika, please. Yeah, he has been guide for Pediatric Endocrine Fellowship. He has got more than 25 publications in national and international journal. And he has had a um, uh, um, lot of uh, multiple uh, chapters in pediatric endocrinology textbooks. Thank you, Dr. Rahul, for being moderator for this case. Dr. Anshika and Dr. Rahul, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'll start my screen sharing. Uh, good evening. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Shaila Ma'am for giving me this opportunity and Rahul sir for moderating my case. I would like to start with the history. We had a eight year, a six month old child who came to us with complaint of not attaining age appropriate height and weight with slight bowing of the right leg for four months. The child currently is nine years and three months old. He was grow according to the parents, he was growing well till five years of age. Thereafter, they noticed that he was falling behind in his growth as compared to the parents. They also noticed anterior bowing of the right leg, which is progressing very slowly over the past four months. The uh, child is studying in third standard and has uh, average scholastic performance. There is no history of recurrent illnesses or hospitalization, no history of chronic nebulizations or repeated blood transfusion, no history of polyuria, recent weight loss, any fractures, uh, hematuria and deafness, and no history of headache, vision abnormalities, or drug intake. Uh, in family history, there is no history of short stature, hypertension, renal diseases, bony deformities, and fractures. In birth history, the child was a, a second issue of a non-consanguinous marriage, born vaginally at term with a birth weight of 2.8 kgs. The past history uh, revealed that a child was treated for transient congenital hypothyroidism till three years of age, following which the thyroid functions normalized and he was off treatment. And he was also diagnosed with a small VST during the neonatal period, which underwent spontaneous closure by two years of age. He has achieved all milestone as per age. And according to the parents, the child had normal diet with normal calories and protein intake. To summarize the history, we have an eight year, six month old boy uh, with normal birth and developmental history with complaints of failure to thrive with a bony deformity. There are no symptoms suggestive of chronic systemic illness with a past history of transient hypothyroidism and a VSD which underwent spontaneous closure. After summary, we would like to examine the child further. So in, on examination, uh, we found that the vitals were uh, normal with a blood pressure of 104 by 60 millimeter of mercury, which was between the 50th to the 90th centile for his age and sex. There was no pallor, icterus, clubbing, cyanosis, lymphadenopathy, or edema. On anthropometry, the child's height was 109.5 centimeter which was falling at uh, minus 3.25 uh, standard deviation score with a height age of five years. The weight was 15.5 kg, which was falling at minus 2.75 uh, standard deviation score with a weight age of 3.6 years. The uh, mid-parenteral height was 168.5 centimeter at minus 0 0.68 standard deviation score. The upper segment and lower segment ratio was 1.1 is to 0.9, which is appropriate for the age. 
So coming, um, evaluating the growth chart, we have the weight age being less than the height age, being less than the chronological age. So uh, in this child, weight was mostly affected. So that points towards either malnutrition or a chronic systemic illness. On head to toe examination, we found that the child had small faces with no uh, dysmorphic features. The child was thin built with prominent ribs and slight anterior bowing of the right lower limb was noticed. No other signs of rickets were seen like widened wrist or a double malleolar. The child's genitalia was normal with prepubertal tanner stage and a systemic examination did not reveal anything significant. So after analyzing the uh, history and the examination, uh, we uh, had uh, for the differential diagnosis, we have to evaluate the other diagnosis for proportionate short, short stature. As we have seen, the weight is the most affected parameter. So in our case, it can be either malnutrition, but uh, according to the parents, the appetite has been normal with normal uh, calorie and protein intake and no other features suggesting of malnutrition. Uh, or uh, it can be chronic systemic illness, which could be cardiac, renal, uh, pulmonary, or uh, gastrointestinal. But uh, on our history, we did not get any chronic symptoms like uh, chronic diarrhea or uh, pointers towards malabsorption or other parameters like uh, repeated nebulization or chest infections, or even um, uh, for cardiac, we didn't have any breathlessness or uh, sinusis episodes. So for uh, ruling out the renal uh, illnesses, we have to further go into the investigations. On investigations, we did the first line screening investigations for short stature, which revealed a normal hemogram. The thyroid function tests were also within normal limits with normal serum creatinine for age. Next, we did a celiac screen for the child, which were, came out to be negative. And a bone age, which is um, not slightly delayed for her, his chronological age. So next, we evaluated the serum electrolytes, which revealed that the potassium was low at 3.2 millimole per liter with a high chloride of 112.5 millimole per liter. The calcium, phosphorus, and PTH was within normal limit with low vitamin D. We did a venous blood gas, which showed the pH to be 7.25, bicarb of 15.5, and a base excess of minus 8.6, which pointed towards a metabolic acidosis. Next, we did the anion gap from the electrolytes, uh, which came out to be 11, which is normal. So we uh, concluded that it was a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Next, we did the ultrasound KUB and found the kidneys uh, were normal in size and eco texture with normal ureters and urinary bladder. There was no evidence of nef uh, nephrocalcinosis or reflux. Following these, uh, we had a, a doubt that it can be a renal disease. So we did a urine examination. The urine electrolytes and urine calcium was done, which showed that the, uh, there was increased uh, urinary calcium with the urine calcium creat ratio of 0 0.56, which is raised. And the urine pH was also raised at 7.0. There was no amino acid urea, glucose urea, or proteinuria and the urine anion gap was calculated, which was positive. So to analyze the complete approach, I would like to uh, go in the stepwise manner. Uh, in our question, first metabolic acidosis was seen and anion gap was calculated. If it would have been high anion gap, that is more than 12, we uh, should have worked up for the high anion gap acidosis, which includes uh, uh, diagnosis like uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, lactic acidosis, uremia, or uh, methanol or ethanol poisoning. But in our patient, we had normal anion gap acidosis, so we did a urinary anion gap. In that, it could be either zero or negative. In, uh, if it would have been a uh, negative urinary anion gap, the first uh, diagnosis uh, would have been diarrhea. But in our patient, there was no history of chronic diarrhea.
or the other possibility is type 2 or proximal renal tubular acidosis. For that, we need the urinary pH to be less than 5.5 with a low uh, serum potassium. And the other features of Fanconi syndrome could be there like amino aciduria, proteinuria, uh, gl glucosuria, phosphaturia, which was not there in our patient. Next, uh, in our uh, patient, we had a positive urinary anion gap. So we evaluated the potassium levels, which if low, can be appointed towards type 1 uh, or distal RTA with a urine pH of 5.5 and a low serum potassium. If the potassium would have been high, that could indicate type 4 or hyperkalemic RTA in that the urinary pH is less than 5.5 with high potassium levels. So uh, following this uh, approach chart, we came to the diagnosis that it can be a distal RTA. To summarize in total, uh, we have an eight-year, six-month-old boy who presented with failure to thrive with a bony deformity. With, uh, he has proportionate short stature, no dysmorphism with anterior bowing of the right leg. On investigation, he had normal anion gap acidosis with low bicarbonate levels with positive urinary anion gap. And hence, we had a working diagnosis of distal renal tubular acidosis. On uh, for the treatment, uh, the child was supposed to be given uh, oral bicarb supplements. For that, uh, he was prescribed Shawl solution with a bicarb dose of 2.5 milli equivalent per k uh, kg per day and potassium of 1.2 milli equivalent per kg per day. Along with that, the child was also supplemented with calcitriol and calcium. The child was followed up uh, over the months and it was seen that the child gradually uh, started improving in height and weight with normalization of the bicarbonate levels. The height, uh, this is over nine months, the height had improved from minus 3.25 SG score to minus 2.76 SG score with a weight increase from uh, minus 2.75 SG score to minus 2.4 SG score with normalization of bicarbonate levels. So in short, I would like to briefly discuss about renal tubular acidosis. It is defined as a clinical syndrome occurring due to disorder of tubular acid-base balance in the presence of normal glomerular filtration rate resulting in hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. It is classified as type 1 or distal RTA, type 2 or proximal RTA, and type 4 or hyperkalemic RTA. Type 2 that is proximal RTA, is due to a defect in the reabsorption of the filtered bicarbonate in the proximal tubules, where 90% of the bicarbonate is uh, reabsorbed after filtration. The disorder involves sodium-potassium ATPase channels, uh, sodium uh, proton antipoter, carbonic anhydrase type 4, and uh, sodium bicarbonate co-transporter. The main feature of uh, proximal RTA is bicarbonate Naturia. If there is amino aciduria, phosphaturia, glucosuria, or uh, low molecular weight of proteinuria, it can be appointed towards a Fanconi syndrome. So, in a uh, proximal RTA, the amount of filtered bicarbonate reduces with lowering of the uh, plasma bicarbonate with no filtration occurring uh, below 12 millimole per liter. That this is the reason why the acidosis in proximal RTA is self-limiting and urine can be acidified to, P, uh, to a pH of less than 5.5 because the distal, acidific uh, distal tubular acidification uh, mechanism is normal. For clinical features, the child will present with polyuria, polydipsia, dehydration, failure to thrive, short stature, and due to uh, uh, hypokalemia, the child will be having muscle weakness and other feature is delayed bone age. In type 1 distal RTA, the defect is in proton ATPase and uh, proton potassium ATPase channels in the distal tubules, leading to impaired excretion of protons. It can also be present as an autosomal mutation in the chloride bicarbonate exchanger, that is AE1, which can be dominant or recessive. The recessive uh, 
form is associated with the sensory neural hearing loss. Distal RTA presents with severe metabolic acidosis, which can be um, fatal, along with hypokalemia. But in this case, the hypokalemia is not as severe as that in proximal RTA. The child will have high urinary pH in the presence of acidosis. There will be bicarbonaturia, natriuresis, hypocitraturia, and hypercalciuria. The positive urine anion gap is due to decreased secretion of ammonium uh, in the urine. And uh, because of uh, hypocitraturia and hypercalciuria, there can be nephrocalcinosis or nephrolithiasis. The clinical features include polyuria, polydipsia, dehydration, failure to thrive, uh, bone pain, and the child may also present with features of rickets and fractures. Uh, there can be family history of renal tubular acidosis and short stature, and sensory new, uh, neural hearing loss can be there in the autosomal recessive form. The type 4 or hyperkalemic RTA is due to impaired aldosterone secretion or aldosterone unresponsiveness in the distal tubules and the collecting ducts. They present mainly with hyperkalemia. There is no nephrocalcinosis or metabolic bone disease in type 4 RTA. The urinary pH uh, can be uh, acidified as appropriate to the degree of acidosis. And uh, the child will present with clinical features of failure to thrive, polyuria, polydipsia, and short stature. They present early in life as hyperkalemia can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. So this is a table differentiating the three kinds of RTAs. In uh, proximal RTA, the potassium will be very low, uh, which will be low in distal RTA, whereas in type 4 or hyperkalemic RTA, it will be high. Urine pH uh, can be used to differentiate between the proximal and the distal RTA. In distal RTA, the urine will be uh, a bit alkaline as compared to normal. So it, the pH will be more than 5.3. And even the urinary calcium will be high in distal RTA. The bicarb excretion uh, in proximal RTA will be more than 15%. That is, there is bicarbonate wasting in proximal RTA. In distal RTA, there is uh, bicarb uh, excretion will be less than 5%, whereas in hyperkalemic RTA, it will be less than 15%. And nephrocalcinosis can be seen in distal RTA. So for the management of uh, renal tubular acidosis, the aim is to correct the acidosis and the electrolyte imbalance. This is done via alkali supplementation, that is via oral bicarbonate. It can be given in the form of tablets or uh, uh, syrups or modified so uh, shawl solution. The dosage in type 1 and type 4 uh, RTA is 2 to 4 milli equivalent per kilogram per day. Whereas in type 2 RTA, it is 2 to 15 milli equivalent per kilogram per day. That is much higher uh, uh, dose is required in proximal RTA. Uh, potassium supplementation may also be required uh, in, the, uh, in the dose of 2 to 4 milli equivalent per kilogram per day. And thiazide diuretics can be used in distal RTA to control um, calciuria and prevent nephrocalcinosis. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you, Anshika, for a good presentation. Basically, this is a very, very common presentation which comes to us in our day-to-day -day practice. And the aim of choosing this case was to highlight a few features which can be of help to the postgraduates and the fellows who are trainees who are attending today's class. Uh, RTA is one of the commonest cases which comes to us and it can come in varied presentations, right from polyuria, polydipsia to body deformities, resistant rickets, recurrent fractures. It can be also be associated with conditions like Wilson's disease or cystine urea or cystinosis. So basically a stepwise approach, which was very well described by Hanshika, will help us to probably diagnose a case of RTA. Few salient features which would be of help to the trainees here would be, like he rightly said, anion gap, which is high, it goes in favor of acidouria or organic acidemia. It would be normal in patients of RTA. 
the urinary ionian gap is always followed in patients of RDA, may not be so in other conditions. One of the slides you show us, shows us that the proximal RTA is associated with amino acid urea and not so in distal acid, distal RTA, but in very rare conditions, distal RTA also could have amino acid urea when it's associated with secondary hyperparathyroidism, right? And uh, urinary pH, yes, it differentiates proximal from distal, but there are a few points one should remember about urinary pH, that when you have urinary tract infection, this urinary pH could be affected. So always be sure that the urinary pH is uh, interpreted in case of normal urine uh, examination. Secondly, it should be assessed or processed immediately after collection. And certain conditions like UTI, which I mentioned, or dehydration could affect the pH and has to be interpreted in that light. This was some few salient features along with that, like you rightly said, growth chart plotting would help us to differentiate and put it at the chronic systemic illness where the weight is more affected than the height. And that can also give us a clue for the underlying etiology. A uh, couple of questions were there in the chat box. Uh, it was from Divya. What are the reasons for unilateral bony deformity in your case? Would you want to answer that, Anchita? So, uh, as there was a vitamin D deficiency, it could be an evolving uh, deformity and we picked it up quite early before any other deformity or uh, uh, there's changes in blood parameters of parathyroid and ALP. Okay. And there was one more question. Why was rocalterol given in distal RTA where cholecalciferol could have been started? I agree with that cholecalciferol could have been given. Vitamin D was slightly lower side, so cholecalciferol could have been tried before we could give the rocalterol in those two times. Okay. Yeah. I welcome Any... Dr. Uma Ali also for the discussion, please. Dr. Uma is the pediatric ne nephrologist from uh, Leelawati Hospital. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Uma Ali, Madam, doesn't need to require the uh, introduction to all of us. She has been an eminent postgraduate guide and has made lives of hundreds of postgraduate students. Currently, she is practicing as a pediatric nephrologist in Vindavati and SRCC hospitals in Mumbai, also attached to Jupiter Hospital. Madam has been dean of BJ uh, Wadia Hospital, also the head of nephrology and PSU at BJ Wadia, and is the pioneer in establishing uh, dialysis services at BJ Wadia and now actively in transplant, uh, renal transplant at Vindavati Hospital. A recipient of multiple national and international awards with a lot of publications to her, her name. Uh, it's a pleasure to invite Madam for this talk. Madam Umali, please. Yeah, thank you. I'll just uh, share the screen. So. Uh, thank you very much to the Endocrine Society for in, uh, inviting a non-endocrine person to this conference. But I think, as we all know, salt and water uh, management is intimately related between hormones and the kidney, with the brain as the central governing organ there. So uh, this, uh, I try to present it as simply as I can. Much of what I'm going to say has been referred to or discussed earlier. Uh, so uh, essentially the maintenance of cell volume is a fundamental property of all living cells and has been highly conserved throughout evolution for 3.5 billion years since a prokaryote appeared in the waters that gave it life, but also threatened its existence. So if the organism was in a hypotonic uh, solution, uh, water, it had the risk of swelling. And if it was in a salty marine water, it had the risk of shrinking. So even this primitive organism had protective mechanisms where it could remove either the water or the salt by efficient mechanisms uh, as needed to keep its biological integrity intact in this external environment. Now with evolution, the terrestrial animals internalized this environment 
and had to develop extremely fine-tuned homeostatic mechanisms to maintain the volume and the tonicity of the milieu. It's essentially because the intake became erratic both due to availability and by choice or preference as we grew into humans. And the control of this largely is between three organ systems. One is the brain and neurological uh, system, endocrine, where many hormones take place, but the most well-studied, well-known are the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system and the ADH. And in the kidney, GFR, yes, it does play a role, but the most important role from the kidney perspective is the tubular functions. So the salt and water, although homeostasis implies that every single solute and the water should be fine-tuned and well-controlled in the optimal uh, quantities required to maintain the biological integrity and de-stress the cells from constantly protecting themselves from a hostile environment. However, due to the macro quantities, the salt and water homeostasis takes prime importance in clinical medicine. And the focus of this is to maintain euvolemia and osmotic equilibrium. Now the volume homeostasis, one of the major mechanisms is your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, though we know it's not the only mechanism, there are lots of sympathetic nervous system, et cetera, which comes immediately into action. But the sustained uh, trying attempt to correct the disturbed homeostasis comes from the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism. The stimulus for renin secretion are three, fallen blood pressure, beta-1 adrenergic activation, and low sodium in the distal tubule, which is sensed by the macula denser and promotes renin secretion. Renin, of course, acts via conversion to angiotensin II, and angiotensin II has a major role. It, has, it increases sodium reabsorption from the proximal tubule, it also stimulates aldosterone so that it has a more sustained effect and sodium absorption is increased in the collecting duct as well. It also promotes ADH secretion and stimulates thirst, both help to retain water. And it has a direct systemic vasoconstrictive action. It also constricts efferent arterioles uh, to maintain the filtration fraction in the face of a low GFR. The osmotic equilibrium is even more finely tuned because the main, as I mentioned in my opening slide, maintaining cellular volume intact is something very, very integral, which has been present billions of years ago in evolution. So the normal serum osmolality we know is about 280 milliosmoles and it is maintained within 1% of normal. And a rise in 1% in serum osmolality stimulate secre secretion of ADH and likewise a decrease by 1% inhibits ADH. And ADH levels are closely related to urine osmolality. So if we take 280 at a point where you have uh, very little vasopressin uh, secreted, the moment it starts rising your vasopressin secretion and you reach maximal urine osmolality of 1200 milliosmoles, quite early when you reach a, a plasma osmolality of 290 and a, a vasopressin levels of five picograms. ADH continues to rise, but urine osmolality cannot increase beyond this point. It's achieved fairly early during this uh, generation of hyperosmolality. And subsequent rise after 290, you get your thirst response, which can further correct your osmolality. Now, if you look at um, how is all this affected, I would say it's something like the building of the Taj Mahal. We all say Shah Jahan built the Taj Mahal. I don't know how many of us uh, know who was the Iranian architect who designed it. And I'm 100% sure none of us know the name of even a single worker who actually built the Taj Mahal. So the renal tubules are something like that. They are very uh, non-descript 60 centimeters, 60 kilometers long kind of twisted and straight tubes. And compared to the glomerulus, they are not at all impressive in appearance. 
But if you see the work they do, it uh, almost I would say that life would have been impossible without renal tubules, at least terrestrial life. Now the glomerulus produces an ultrafiltrated, roughly for mathematical purposes, taken 100 ml per minute, which means there would be 144 liters of primary ultrafiltrate per day, which is extremely non-selective. It is only limited by the size of the pores in the glomerular basement membrane and the charge. So whether you need it or you don't need it, a large amount of your sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarbonate, glucose, amino acid, and multiple other solutes come out in this ultrafiltrate. And you need that 99% of this should be reabsorbed or even little more so that you, your secondary ultrafiltrate, which is your urine output, is not more than average, one liter per day. So if reabsorption decreases even by 2%, urine output would become three liters per day. So you can see at this volume, uh, volume of 100 ml per minute, uh, if you had no renal tubules, in 20 minutes, a small infant would lose almost the entire plasma volume and would die of irreversible shock. So what is the immediate need is because this was uh, sent non-selectively, is to reabsorb rapidly a bulk reabsorption without caring what you're reabsorbing, reabsorb as much as possible. So to do this, we have the proximal tubule shown in the green, which is the gatekeeper. So it shuts the gate so that you reabsorb almost two thirds of the salt and water and almost, uh, most 80% of the bicarbonate which you have. So it, uh, to do this, it needs enormous capabilities. Okay? So that is why it is convoluted to increase its surface area. It needs abundant energy. It needs a mechanism for initiating the activity and a system in place. And this is exactly what we see in the proximal tubule. Uh, not only is it uh, macroscopically like uh, convoluted, but you have the surface with a lot of microvillus formation, which increase the absorptive surface. You have abundant mitochondria over here to give you the energy. You have a sodium potassium ATPase pump in abundance in the basolateral surface, which is your prime energy giver. And also which gives you the electrical gradient to encourage sodium reabsorption. And many of the molecules we know, like glucose, amino acids, various amino acids, are co-transported with sodium. So it has a system in place, which is immediately uh, put into action. Okay. So if you have a proximal tubular defect, you're bound to have a solute diuresis. So a lot of solutes are going to flow out because the subsequent segments of the tubules uh, are more for fine tuning and for precision, and they cannot handle very large volumes of sodium and other electrolytes they cannot reabsorb in. So you will by default have polyuria due to electrolyte losses. But the fingerprint which tells you that you're ten, probably dealing with the proximal tubular defect or the footprint which, uh, by which say you can play the Sherlock Holmes is your hypophosphatemia. You have hypokalemia, you have metabolic acidosis as expected, glycosuria, amino aciduria, which may be there also. But phosphorus is reabsorbed only in the proximal tubule. So when you have hypophosphatemia along with this picture, you know that there is a defect in the proximal tubule. The only other situation as uh, already referred in the previous case, if you have a high PTH in distal RTA, you may have secondary lowering of uh, phosphorus. So no single parameter in itself uh, is totally conclusive, but hypophosphatemia in this setting would tell you that this is a proximal defect uh, even before you go ahead. Okay. But the next important segment, almost you could say lying in the same segment uh, of the outer medulla, like the lower part of the proximal tubule, is the thick ascending loop of Henle. Now, this is the next important segment, which has a major sodium reabsorptive work, but it is selective. It is not like proximal 
uh, tubule with bulk reabsorption. It selectively reabsorbs your chloride along with your sodium potassium by the NKCC2 transporter in the luminal surface. And about 20% of your sodium is absorbed in this area. So this, so, and another important feature of the segment, it, it's water impermeable. So the urine within the tubule at this junction gets progressively dilute because sodium is going out but water is not going out. So it is getting progressively dilute. And another important ish, uh, feature is this sodium accumulates in the medullary interstitium and contributes to the development of your hyperosmolality of the medullary region, interstitial region, which gives you the gradient for water reabsorption when ADH acts. So it creates a hypertonic medullary interstitium and is responsible, this loop of Henle is responsible for almost 50% of the medullary interstitial hypertonicity. Uh, so the loop of Henle being a site of uh, quite a significant amount of chloride, sodium, potassium reabsorption, defects in the loop of Henle, like we heard about the various genetic defects which lead to Barter syndrome, will give you solute diuresis. So the classical feature is also what you see when you give furosemide because it acts at this junction. So you will again have polyuria because you have solute diuresis and you had, you, it can be manifest in the uh, uh, fetal life as polyhydramnios and hyponatremia in the early neonatal period because of salt wasting disease. And subsequently, you see the typical feature of hypokalemia, uh, metabolic alkalosis, et cetera, which would be the footprint of loop of Henle defects when you see this combination. I'm not going through the distal uh, tubule much because uh, not that it doesn't contribute to solute dist uh, losses, uh, just in the interest of going to the clinical part. But an important one I want to mention is, of course, your aldosterone sensitive segment, which uh, is in your collecting tubule in the principal cells. And the epithelial sodium channel uh, preferably takes in sodium, aldosterone stimulated, which, st and which stimulates both the AT, sodium potassium ATPase and the ENAC. And this absorption of sodium is essential have to have a luminal negativity to encourage potassium excretion, as well as by the adjacent alpha intercalated cell, your HIN excretion. The action of this uh, may be opposed by your atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay. And we come to the very important, which has been extensively discussed, so except for mentioning it, I'm not going to go further, of uh, your ADH action, which is primarily concerned now, we are moving from solute to water, diuresis. So your AVP, which combines the V2 receptors and allows the expression of aquaporin 2 from the cytoplasmic to the membrane position to encourage water reabsorption. A segment which I deliberately kept last uh, because it's an amazing se segment, which is thin loops of Henle. And I'd like to say that the kidney takes in blood supply, which is uh, much more than what the mass of the kidney is because it's more for the ultrafiltration than oxygen extraction. So almost 20 to 25% of the cardiac output, but the bulk of this 95% goes to the cortex. Only 5% goes to the renal medulla. And as you go further down the medulla, this is very little, which you get through the vasa recta. Also, most of the energy uh, has already been taken up by all these other segments, the proximal tubule, which takes the bulk, the distal tubule, which uh, does more precision uh, reabsorption of different solutes by different transporters, doesn't deal with bulk, but as I said, is hormone sensitive and uh, precise in its function and requires energy. So a lot of energy is gone, the remaining over here. So by the time you come to this thin loop of Henle, you're getting not more than 2% of total blood supply. And that too from the efferent arteriole of the glomerulus, which already has now little lesser oxygen. 
So low oxygen supply. So no sodium potassium ATP is pumped because where do you have the energy? Not much micro, uh, mitochondria, but it has some extraordinary uh, way of uh, facing when it faces a brick wall. So I would compare it if the proximal tubule can be compared to the industries of Tata and the distal tubule of the Infosys, then this loop, I would put like what I know of the Dharavi of Mumbai, where with the least resources, they will be innovative and productive. So what this loop has done is just a differential permeability to water and salt. The descending loop has aquaporin one, so the water can come out, but the salt cannot. So you have progressively more and more salty urine with the tip having the saltiest, about 1200 milliosmoles. And the ascending loop now is impermeable to water. So the water cannot go out, but now since you've concentrated so much sodium, besides the thick loop of Henley, some sodium passively can come out from the ascending limb to the make the medullary hypertonicity. Uh, we know that the vasa recta arrangement in a hairpin and countercurrent manner also helps to maintain the hyperosmolality. And the loop has taken the advantage of the low blood flow because that helps to not wash out the hypertonic medulla. So all the disadvantages have been converted to advantages in the thin loop of Henry. So we have a progressively increased osmolality from the cortex to the medulla. One last part in the physiological aspects of uh, all the polyurea is urea. Now, urea reabsorption occurs in the inner medullary collecting duct, much beyond all the other where sodium transporters are present. And it is uh, uh, encouraged by ADH action when urea gets more reabsorbed. And it gets, sorry, it gets recycled. Uh, by getting reabsorbed into the loop of Henley and again circulating. So that is an economical way of using urea. And almost 50% of your hypertonicity, half was contributed by sodium and half by urea. The clinical implication is if you are having a very poor protein intake, you are malnourished, or you have a serious liver problem, etc., then you may not produce enough urea. So you will have a low concentrating capacity, even though other mechanisms may be intact. So the clinical problems that we see with salt and water are dehydration, oliguria, edema, polyuria, and dysnatremia. And I'm covering some of these here. Now, the clinical approach to these disorders, what kind of a disorder is straightforward. You clinically examine, except for the sodium problems, the rest are clinically overt. And a few others like the uh, sodium disorders, et cetera, can be detected by your routine blood test of electrolytes. But why has it happened? The clue to that comes from a study of various parameters in the urine, chief of which is your urine osmolality and electrolytes, uh, not to ignore other urinary abnormalities like proteinuria immaturia, because they may be pointers to a renal disease. Now, the most clinically widely used in the pediatric population is the differentiation of pre-renal from intrinsic renal failure in the setting of oliguria to determine whether you need to give more fluids or restrict fluids or what should you be doing. And we have some very rough parameters like BUN creatinine in more than 20 is to 1 and pre-renal 10 is to 1 in intrinsic hypokalemia likely to be there in pre-renal if it is following GI losses, not necessary to be there, as opposed to hyperkalemia and intrinsic renal failure. Acidosis or alkalosis, depending your root and type of losses, usually acidosis and intrinsic renal failure. And then your urinary parameters, like urine osmolality, it's a concentrated urine, so it'll definitely be more than an isosmolar fluid, more than 300, often very much more. Whereas it'll be around 300 in an intrinsic renal failure. Random urine sodium spot will be less than 20 and here more than 20. A more uh, kind of precise method would be to 
do a fractional excretion of sodium, which is less than 1% and more than 2%. This is what we know. Each one of these parameters has its own KVX and cannot be taken as absolute. Okay, even in pre renal failure, a person with severe protein uh, uh, deprivation would not have a high urea nitrogen. And on the other hand, if an intrinsic renal failure, septic, catabolic, high dose of steroids, the BUN can shoot up much higher. The, again, you may not concentrate very well if you do not have medullary hypertonicity, as I mentioned earlier. And even fractional excretion of sodium may have some caveats, like if you have a contrast-induced renal injury, because of the severe vasoconstriction, your fractional excretion of sodium may look low, but they have an intrinsic renal failure. And if, if you've given prior diuretics, uh, then your fractional excretion of sodium may be more than 2%. Or the other way around, if you have a patient with already who has who's some kind of a CKD, some glomerular dysfunction, GFR decrease earlier, then in spite of pre-renal, the fractional excretion of sodium would be high because of the native kidney disease. So this is a five-year-old girl with gastroenteritis, was admitted at a different hospital with dehydration and oliguria, was given one or two normal saline doses, boluses, and as urine output was absent, was given a single dose of IV furosemide with not a great urine output and hence was referred. At the time of admission, BUN was 45, creatinine 1.5, which looked more like pre-renal, but urine osmolality was only 300, sodium was high, fractional excretion was high. And this was in the background of having received one furosemide. So we still have no conclusion whether, whether it's pre-renal or intrinsic renal. So clinical examination still would make a good addition to what we have. And uh, one, should we give more fluids or restrict fluids if the clinical scenario is not that clear? One could do a fractional excretion of urea. A fractional excretion of urea in this child was 10.5%, in which is usually less than 35% in pre-renal and more in intrinsic. And the reason that it's not affected by furosemide is what I said earlier that furosemide, furosemide acts at a much higher part of the tubule and the urea reabsorption occurs far beyond that. So it's not affected by furosemide action as opposed to the fractional excretion of sodium, which is directly affected by furosemide. Uh, we've already heard the definitions of polyurea and yes, different books do describe different levels of urine output. Roughly, we usually take as more than four ml per kg per hour as important. Now, one thing I want to talk about is the urinary compartments. These are virtual compartments which we create. There are no true compartments in the urine. So you can imagine the urine as a portion which has an obligate water loss and a portion which has a free water loss. When we say obligate water loss, it's the water that is accompanying the solutes because that's the primary excretion which is occurring for uh, to achieve at least an isosmolar excretion. So the main renal solute load comes from your dietary proteins and your sodium intake. So that determines your renal solute. And in a Western adult diet, the daily solute load is about 600 to 900 milliosmols a day or roughly 10 milliosmols per kg. Now, the amount of obligate water, now we do not always excrete isosmolar urine when we excrete solutes, though that may be the most de-stressing way for the kidney of excreting, but it would require a large amount of water intake if your solute load is high. So if you're taking 900 milliosmols per day, then you would have to take almost three liters of water to excrete an isosmolar urine. Most of us do not consume that much. So the amount of obligate water loss for a given solute intake depends on how much water you're taking and whether your renal concentrating capacity is intact. So an intact concentrating capacity, I'm just reiterating, needs an intact loop of Henle, a hypertonic medulla, which requires, in addition, adequate urea over there because that contributes 50%. 
intact ADH mechanism and absence of any interfering drugs which would affect the concentrating capacity. As opposed to that, the free water excretion is uh, basically water that's excreted without solutes. Many prefer to look at it as electrolyte free water excretion, in which case it may be either water without any solutes or uh, water with non-electrolyte solutes. Now, free water excretion requires intact diluting mechanism, and it needs a good ADH inhibition. So we already have discussed uh, in earlier lectures, free water diuresis. So the solute diuresis may be electrolyte, which is driving it or non-electrolytes. And we all know about diabetes, mellitus, mannitol. But some of the other solutes that are not so easily measurable and don't come immediately to the mind are urea, ketones without high glucose, like we see in the organic acidemias, and in milder polyurea, especially in ICU, children who don't yet have a renal dysfunction, it can also be driven by many of your uh, penicillin drugs, which are given like piperacillin, carbonicillin, which are given in very high doses because these are organic anions and will carry with it sodium potassium for excretion. Clinically, we know history, uh, urine output, measuring it, water intake, salt craving, craving for ice water. Salt craving often points to a tubular problem. Craving for ice water, classically seen in your central GI. Polyhydramnios, as far as kidneys is concerned, almost equates with Barter syndrome. Prematurity, age of onset, insidious kidney failure, et cetera. Weight, high BP, hydration, CNS state, especially for dysnatremias. Your blood investigation standard, which we all know and routinely do. Serum osmolality is an important uh, investigation when you do a C polyuria. And the additional which may throw a light on what you're dealing with is your urine osmolality and then your urine electrolytes and maybe urine urea glucose, et cetera. Now, urine osmolality is, a, is an important cutoff point that when you have solute diuresis, your urine osmolality is usually high, more than 300 milliosmoles per liter. And water diuresis, you have a low urine osmolality, less than 150 or even less than 100, depending on the severity. And when you have mixed solute and water diuresis, it will be somewhere in between. Uh, these two. So the urine osmolality might tell you clearly which way you should be looking at if you already have not got strong clinical clues to what is happening. Hmm? So <clears throat> these are the things I'm just, just the same. One important thing is also, if required, we can calculate urine osmolality instead of measuring which is two times your urinary sodium plus potassium, your urea, u, urinary urea nitrogen upon 2.8 and glucose upon 18. But many times we don't need to do the glucose measurement if glucose is negative on testing. Okay. I'll just uh, give this as an illustration for a child with polyuria. And this uh, with a nine-year-old girl was operated for an abdominal emergency, developed post-op sepsis. She was mechanically ventilated, resuscitated fluid zinotropes, and due to intestinal failure, she was on TPN, developed AKI with fluid overload, and needed CRRT for three days. AKI improved, and, but post-AKI, she had a diuresis of 6 ml per kg per hour. But what happened was the serum sodium increased from 140 to 155. And uh, free water was calculated and given, and the fluids were changed. She was on full strength NS earlier because she was, had been in shock that had continued. It was reduced to 0.45, but still sodium remained at 160. Changed to 5% dextrose, but still serum sodium did not come down. So at this point, uh, it, uh, further investigations were undertaken. The urine osmolality was 400 milliosmoles per kg, which was definitely pointed to a solute diuresis. It also told us that the urine is not adequately concentrated because with this degree of hypernatremia, we would have expected more than 600. And uh, so the cause was an obvious cause. The child had a renal dysfunction from which she was recovering. 
And so the kidney function is not totally normal yet. So is there a loss of free water also in the urine we need to see? Now, for that, you measure your urine sodium potassium and your serum sodium simultaneous potassium. Now, your urine sodium plus potassium is much less than the serum sodium plus potassium. So this points to a loss of electrolyte free water, which is happening when your urinary electrolytes are much lower than the sum of your serum electrolytes. You can even calculate how much electrolyte free water is excreted. If you multiply the urine volume into one minus your urine sodium plus potassium divided by your serum sodium. So this roughly came to about almost 1.2 liters. But it did, still doesn't tell us why is this child polyuric? There's not that, many, that much electrolytes going, but the urine osmolality is high. So definitely there must be some non-electrolyte solute, which is not glucose because that was negative. She was not receiving mannitol. So uh, we did a 24 hours collection and that osmolality was 554. Urinary sodium in this 24 hours was 85 and 30 potassium. Calculated osmolality from electrolytes, two into sodium plus potassium, was about 230. So you almost had 324 milliosmoles that are not accounted by electrolytes. So we measured urinary urea and it was very high, we were equating almost 240 or some milliosmoles per kg. So why was this high urinary urea present? There were multiple causes. Her, although she had recovered in terms of urine output, her blood urea was still high at 126 milligrams, although the creatinine had come down. Uh, she was septic, so she could have had high urea from catabolism. Another important part was she was on TPN all these days and the TPN was delivering when we calculated 2 mg per kg of amino acids, which was a little high for a child with renal failure. And so there was a urea, which was the solute along accompanied with the, with the water. And urea competes with sodium also for excretion. So what we did was stop TPN for two days corrected the deficit drop by 10 milliequivalents per day by giving enteral water, because water she could tolerate. And we gave her a maintenance fluid with dextrose. By now, her potassium was uh, getting to be on the lower side, so we added potassium. And extra urine, which uh, she was passing more than 4 ml per kg per hour, was replaced volume for volume with half NS because her urinary sodium was about 85. So after 24 hours, the serum sodium came down to the 150s and after another 48 hours to 142. And then when she was okay for a day or two, TPN was started with lower amino acids. So the last part I'll say is uh, the most common electrolyte abnormality, especially in ICU children is hyponatremia. And we tend to think of hyponatremia as excessive sodium loss, excessive water intake, or disproportionate salt loss and water intake. But there are a few things we need to remember that the body has very fine tuning for sodium uh, management. So sodium loss is usually accompanied by water loss in the major segments where uh, sodium is reabsorbed. So it often leads to hypovolemia, not hyponatremia. Water, we know that if there's even a 1% decrease in osmolality, it inhibits ADH secretion. So even, though, even when you go down from 135 to 134 or 133, your ADH will be inhibited. The capacity to dilute urine by the kidney is very large. The kidney, in the absence of ADH, can bring, out, bring down its urine osmolality to as low as 50 milliosmoles per liter. So the primary reason one develops hyponatremia in hospitalized children is the inability to excrete free water. So in this, we are looking at the production of ADH in sick children, which may be osmotically inappropriate, but may be physiologically appropriate because its ADH is also a response to severe hypovolemia, hypotension, et cetera. Though it's not the first reactor, Hypovolemia has to be significant to a loss of about 6 to 7% by 
volume before ADH is stimulated. But once ADH comes into play due to volume stimulus, it overrides the osmotic stimulus. What we call inappropriate. Nature never does anything inappropriate inappropriate it's prob uh, there is a good reason for it which i will not go into it right now but we know the number of conditions which exist which can give you uh, adh without any volume or osmotic stimuli and which are present in many of the sick children and what what restricts the ability to generate the dilute urine one we already spoke of adh and although that's the most important one in critical illness there are also other things. You have to have adequate urine reaching your diluting segments, which starts from ascending loop of Henle and collecting tubule. These are the two main segments for dilution. So if you have a low GFR, it has dropped due to your critical illness. You're not even having sufficient urine here for a dilution. You may have already suffered tubular injury. As I said, this uh, medulla is a hypoxic region. So it's already at maximum oxygen at, uh, extraction. So the moment you get hypovolemia, hypotension, uh, hypoxia, it will shut off and close shop to protect itself from further damage. And so you may already be having tubular injury, even though your creatinine may not reflect it. And of course, all the reason non-osmotic stimulus of ADH, which claims a primary role here. So if you look at it, any sick child who warrants an ICU admission is likely to be in a condition where he or she will not be able to dilute urine and is at risk of developing hyponatremia, especially if we give hypotonic fluids, which the water content of it, they will not be able to handle. And how do we know if the kidney is excreting adequate free water? Simple, check the urine osmolality. We said it should be below 100. If you got rich, good water excretion, that will happen if it's polydipsia or if you have a reset osmostat as in malnourished children. Whereas inadequate free water excretion is if your urine osmolality is more than 100. It's not essential that the urine osmolality has to be higher than serum osmolality to uh, diagnose an inappropriate ADH secretion. It is inappropriate if you cannot dilute the urine and it is sampling it. So it always means there is ADH present in this scenario. So this is the last case. 18 month old child weighing 10 kg came with rub bronchiolitis, treated 24 hours later, child respiratory wise was better but developed a GTC seizures followed by apnea to be intubated, transferred to ICU with a blood sugar, which was normal. Seizures despite two doses of midazolam, electrolyte showed 123 sodium. There was no pre-illness electrolyte because uh, the child didn't come with any GI or other problem. This was sufficiently low to cause symptoms. And we could see that the urine osmolality measured was 300, which was grossly inadequate to dilute the urine and urine sodium also was high. So this was uh, high ADH circulating and this child was given isolite P, which is a very hypotonic solution. And hence, this is what has happened. So I'll conclude saying that the kind of a very unimpressive looking tubules does a lot of work. In places, it has very strong energy, like in the proximal tubule. In the left, right-hand side, we see the multiple functions the distal tubule does in fine tuning the final ultrafiltrate. And the very sad looking uh, loop of Henle, in fact, is the major determinant for your concentrating the urine. So I'll end with this thought for today that what I feel as a nephrologist is what made life on earth feasible is the renal tube. If it was not for that, we would all be dying of dehydration. So. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, uh, for your lucid talk on renal uh, function and uh, revising actually the physiology and uh, complemented uh, by practical cases, which uh, are very useful in our uh, in our practice. Thanks for uh, your talk. And I'm afraid we are uh, uh, shooting off time, so we won't be able to take much many questions. But there are a few questions in the chat box, uh, which says. Uh, 
one of them is uh, what should be the solute intake for a child of one year old with di and are there any specific labs this is the other question are there any specific labs uh, that do measure osmolality and many labs they actually calculate it so these two questions uh, yeah. if you can answer i think as a principle of uh, management in a di uh, although it's a disorder of free water excretion your obligate water excretion will be reduced if you give a lower solute load so especially in nephrogenic di which cannot be specifically addressed effectively unlike central di it's very important to lower the solute load and since you usually diagnose it in infancy uh, that means you need to choose a milk which is uh, not too high in protein which has low sodium uh, so as closely resembling breast milk as possible i would put it say in protein content and sodium content so that you don't increase the solute load on the kidney so the obligate water losses become less so since this is massive polyuria everything you do uh, will help in this trial mm -hmm. the other questions which you ask about osmolality i think uh, many hospitals now do but i'm fully aware that osmolality is expensive it's not available everywhere and many hospitals which have it you may not get the answer the time you want it you send it to me may get the thing in the evening or next day so it's not a very great help to you in an acute setting in a chronic setting you can still afford to wait over there uh although not a great surrogate marker a reasonable marker in these setups is urine specific gravity okay so roughly and the specific gravity i feel should be measured at the bedside by a refractometer and not by the multi sticks because that has other many interfering uh, chemically interfering uh, agents with the measurement uh, the refractometer is using optical density which is again a surrogate marker for specific gravity the surrogate of surrogate so it is not the best of methods that if you're looking at a specific question that is my urine very dilute you will get an answer the specific gravity will show it's less than 1005 and if you want to say is my urine concentrated the concentrating value it may be fairly reliable if the specific gravity is showing above 1020 or 1025 but in between it is not that correlating with osmolality but if your question is you know that i am i inappropriately not diluting the urine is it too concentrated then if you're going to have something like 10 10 it's definitely not diluting the urine so you could in given context use specific gravity as a surrogate marker of osmolality mm -hmm. so when you don't have so that is what we used many times i worked 40 years at vadia children's hospital where we never had a small lalit it was pretty expensive to send it out and get it now i'm working in luxury i get a small lalit <laughs> thank you so much madam for the answers uh, i would like to hand it over to dr shaila for uh, her final words thank you thank you uh... madam and uh, thank you professor daniel it was excellent uh, discussion i think we have really learnt lot of both physiology and the uh, newer uh, <laughs> innovations in the mutations uh, in the water and salt uh, homeostasis thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting our invitation and giving a beautiful lecture thank you and also uh, hari you can give out of thanks and then those yeah so uh, first of all i'd like to thank uh, our eminent speakers uh, professor bishop from uh, quebec canada and uh, dr uma ali from mumbai india and uh, for wonderful insights in in water and electrolyte homeostasis i would like also like to thank our moderators dr rakesh kumar and dr rahul zagirdar for moderating the case presentation and also uh, dr payal and uh, uh, anshika for uh, uh, having a case presentation for uh, presenting the cases 
and I'd like to thank all the attendees for uh, joining and on a Saturday evening. And uh, it, it was a long session, and uh, uh, staying with us uh, till the end is really uh, I'm thankful of. Uh, I thank Dr. Shaila Mairam for uh, uh, for her continued guidance and support, and all the EB members of uh, ISPE for uh, uh, for extending their support and making this. Uh, uh, event uh, uh, possible and successful also. And finally, I would like to thank uh, the uh, the technical support uh, given by uh, RX events, particularly uh, Ankit and Ayush uh, for their uh, help. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to uh, conclude uh, this 13th uh, edition of ISPE ACES. And uh, uh, any final words from Dr. Shaila? No, no, I have. have yeah. Okay, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you all.